So welcome to the Plone Podcast, Episode 1, with Philip Bauer of Startcell DE, who's a longtime Plonista, somebody who wears a beard very well, and is an expert guide tour for weird things to see in the Sorrento Hotel. I guess, really, we should probably start with uh, asking you, Philip, to tell us a little bit more about your background, the things that led you to Plone. That sounds really ominous, too. Well, no, that's, I don't know, what led me to Plone. I, um, I guess there's this time in your life, uh, you know, everybody has it when you, uh, you're young and you don't know what to do, so you could just, I don't know, go out, sell yourself to the highest bidder, uh, go into academia, uh, be a rising star in politics, uh, or end up bartending. Uh, I focused on the last, actually, uh, because I decided not to finish my PhD. But then my phone rang after I decided that I'm going to ask for the in the pub that I like the most to be a bartender, which they probably would have turned me down because I, I drank too much at that time, maybe. Not sure. Um, so then my phone rang and there was a... a a colleague from a, of a friend was on the phone and they asked, told me, um, we, uh, we need a website. I said, sure, that's what I do. Uh, aside from writing a PhD in history, I did small websites and they said, yeah, but something really big for the uh, uh, documentation center about national socialism in Munich. And um, so I talked to my friend with whom I was working with, um, at that time, and he said, oh, we're gonna need a CMS, and I was going, what? What year was this? Uh, no idea. Uh, you don't know him. No, no, uh, what, what year was this happening in? Oh, that was, you know, before you were born. Um, so like in mid-1850s, something like that? <laughs> no, that was, I have no idea. That was uh, early 2000s, uh, 2004, five, six. Yeah. Something like that. And this was uh, meant to be a, a website to document national social nationalist. Well, there social a, the national socialism uh, not it didn't originate in Munich, but a big part of its history was in Munich, and uh, the party grew strong in Munich and had its headquarters in Munich. Uh, so um, Munich, yeah, can be said to be like the the historically. Uh, the the birth birth ground maybe something like that and um, also the uh, it was called the Hauptstadt der Bewegung yeah very German um, so there is a center uh, about that a museum uh, that was planned to be built and they uh, wanted a website basically by the city of Munich and so uh, we since I was a historian I was like um, that's why they asked me because. Uh, they knew I did websites and I, I was a historian of uh, contemporary history. And so, uh, yeah. So what kind, what my kind of tools? Said, we need a CMS. And I said, a what? I don't know what you're talking about. I said, yeah, something like Typo 3. I was going, never heard of that. Uh, or maybe Plone. I don't know. Let's evaluate. And uh, basically, he did the evaluation. He said, Plone is better. And I believed him and uh, still do. Um, so wow. that's, that's how that happened. It had nothing to do with me. And none, no uh, due diligence was done by me. I just uh, followed along. I, I believed a friend. I trusted him. What's, what sort of tools were you using to build websites before that? I uh, don't mention that. Uh, .NET. Uh, HTML, heard of that? Mm. Know that thing? That's well, very I, obscure. Yeah, I, I was doing websites since 1997. That's when I started doing my first websites. That was a pure HTML. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, .NET, so you were writing your own tools to build websites? No. Not at all. We just uh, we you, we wrote HTML and added some some ASP 
dot net or whatever uh, was available. Uh, I didn't do any of the really heavy lifting because I've never been a programmer uh, by education. That came self-taught uh, from with time. So, but but how the, the interesting point is once my uh, colleague said, uh, "Plone, that's the thing we're going to use for that website." I was uh, I was excited. It was it was an amazing tool because I could do all these things through the web without knowing what to do. And I found this uh, email list uh, where I, where I asked questions, and I said um, I experimented and I tinkered with this file and I got a really angry reply by Andreas Jung that you shouldn't tinker, you shouldn't change a file without knowing what you're doing. Um, but I still did, I persisted. Uh, so that uh, got me uh, finished and the, the website is no longer online but that was a great project. Um, so that's that worked. Yeah. How, 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 long, was, how long was the website up? Uh, 10 years or so. Hmm. Hmm. Is the museum built? Yeah, sure. It's a it's a huge thing. It's, it's wow. excellent. If you ever come to Munich, you should definitely go and visit it. That's cool. Oh, uh, well, actually, I was going to mention how you're going to run the Plone Conference in, I guess, 2022 now. Oh, yeah. This is the, the first place this is being officially the, announced. There are yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not as sure as you are about that because, uh, I don't know, you need a, a crew uh, of people organizing a conference and uh, the heart of the crew in Munich is uh, currently uh, seriously ill, Max Jakob, who's actually, his fault is that I stayed with Plone basically because he ran the Plone user group at the University of Munich. And when I came to Munich to, the, uh, to that, I, I, found it online that there was the uh, DZUG, Deutsche Soap User Group, Plum, also Plum User Group, uh, meeting uh, at the University in Munich. I just went there um, and uh, had no clue about anything and they welcomed me with open arms and they answered all my questions and they uh, did the appropriate sounds of affection for uh, the project I did. Uh, even though it was probably uh, ridiculously incompetent, whatever I uh, touched at that point. Um, but um, they were so welcoming that I just uh, decided, oh, I'm gonna, just going to stay there, even though the website was finished at some point. This is a common thread that, for, for, for me too, that the reason why I stuck with Plone was just the general friendliness and the helpfulness of people in the Plone community. It is, it is, it's become a second extended family to me. It's, it's a big part of why I'm still doing Plone, or why I still enjoy doing Plone. Mm -hmm. It's not only the technology that uh, keeps me there because it's, it is exciting, definitely, and challenging at, at times and uh, always something new to learn. But uh, I don't know, the, the heart is in for the people. Yeah, I mean, the reason why we're talking is because, I don't know, we somehow became friends. Yeah, because I dragged you into that elevator. Actually, it happened well before then. I'm trying to think now. All right, yeah. We, yeah, we so talked I, first on the bus in San Francisco at the conference. I, yes, that's right. Because I first remember noticing you, you know, not in that way, but, you know. Well, okay, so in San Francisco, there was, um, I guess at the end of the day, there must have been announcements, or maybe it was at the beginning of one of the days, and you stood up to announce your Plone conference with a K, and you were almost manic with energy. I mean, like this big German guy standing in front, hectoring us in, in somewhat accented English, but of course your English is a hundred times better than my German, maybe a thousand times. So, so here's this guy, big guy standing in front of everybody and just forcefully announcing that we are all going to go to the Plone conference with a K. <laughs> I, I, I still remember I got, I had a slide uh, saying Achtung baby. Oh, that sounds yeah. right. Yeah. I, I, I love that idea. Yeah. That was, um, that was also, uh, an exciting, uh, time. Uh, that was 2000, 
2012. We yeah. had the conference in mm-hmm. Munich, I think. Uh, and it was so much work. We just over-professionalized everything. It was crazy. Uh, what we did for marketing and, uh, I don't know, talk acquisition, everything. Uh, there was almost half a year of work. It was just crazy. But it, we had so much positive energy also. It was a great group. Uh, Max at the heart of it because he also gave us uh, access to the university. So we got the room for uh, very little money, um, if any, I can't remember. So mm-hmm. that, that makes it accessible uh, to people so if you don't have to pay thousands of dollars for a location you get can get students and uh, planistas in for free almost it wasn't free but we had we had the be- i think we had the best uh party food not the best party definitely not uh but we had the best party food at the conference party there that was just amazing it was an italian restaurant and they just <coughs> they dished it out my god so- where are the photos for this? I mean, do you still have the photos? Uh, the only, I have a photo of me paying the bill and tipping over a thousand dollars, which uh, euros, um, which later I learned from the uh, f- uh, finance officer of the uh, Python f- uh, Foundation uh, that for this kind of event you don't tip. So yeah, I I still did uh, couldn't couldn't go back the day after and say um, can I can I please get my tip back? <laughs> that would be pretty rude. Uh, I guess there are a couple. We had a couple of photos at the uh, on the website for the conference with a K. So mm. it was it was a good conference. Uh, Plone API was born during that conference because. We invited a couple of people. We had a couple of English-speaking spring, uh, talks, but most of them were German intentionally because we, that's the target audience was not developers, was not the Plone conference with a C, uh, but like decision makers and people like that. They probably didn't come anyway. Now, uh, there were a lot of people and uh, I guess business was made. Uh, but uh, a couple of developers from Slovenia, you know, uh, there were sitting in the room and just decided, to, okay, let's just uh, start writing the tests and the documentation for uh, Plone API before writing a single line of code for Plone API. So that was wow. excellent. Do you remember wh- who, who were they? It was Nate. It was Nate and yeah. anyone? Do you uh, I think Domin was also there and... Um, but uh, Nate was definitely uh, Nate Supan, who's doing uh, a lot of uh, pyramid at the moment uh, currently. He was uh, definitely the driving force behind that. That's and really so everybody cool. was sprinting on that while the talks were going on in the other room. Ooh, I have no idea. This is great. Yeah. See, because I thought the Plone API, I remember the Plone API was in existence uh, in 2014 in Bristol when we had the big strategic discussion but I hadn't realized where, what its origins had been. That's very cool. Yeah, maybe he came with the plan to do that already, but um, well, that's where it started. I didn't, I definitely didn't have the, I didn't have the idea. My first, my first uh, big sprint contribution at a conference was actually breaking the build, it's like, many times but my very first commit to the plone core to cmf plone broke the bill uh, in in san francisco at the conference and we were all pretty new to git at that point um, rock and others just uh, dragged us to okay we have to move from uh, subversion to git and my first commit broke everything everybody was so new even rock was so new that he had to revert he didn't revert the commit he rewrote the history. So we went from room to room telling everyone, hey, hands off, stop. <laughs> so he forced, he, he revert, he, I don't know, he undid the commit, I don't know, uh, git reset head, uh, I don't know, uh, dash one thingy. Uh, and then he did a force push, I guess. I didn't know what he was doing at that point. So that was my first contribution to clone is breaking everything. And I've been trying to rebuild it ever since. I thought you were going to say you keep trying to break it every time you can. Uh, I'm 
I'm, I got yelled at too many times by Timo, right? so I try not to break it anymore. But it's, it's happening more often than I want to count. The conference with the case, so that was held, that, was that LMU? Yeah, there was, uh, no, it actually was not, it was at uh, other university in, in Munich, but uh, since Max has uh, excellent connections to all the academia, um, we just got that uh, nice building for free. What's the name of the, what's the, name of the other university then? Uh, that's Hochschule München. There's there are two universities and one Hochschule, which is I don't know, uh, also a university. It's basically a technical university, but you don't get like I don't know, different diplomas, whatever. And the LMU is Ludwig Maximilian. Yeah, and the TU is the big technical university. So we, oh, there's three. Yeah, there's oh, there's plenty. We have a university for philosophy, and you know I don't know stuff is happening here in Munich. Yeah. I was I, I should know all that. I was head of the student union in a previous life, uh, but can't can't remember. That's very interesting because a lot of people say that oh computer science degrees are the official way that you should get a computer software job. And I've met so many people who started off in completely different areas of education who've ended up being really good programmers. That's true. We have a lot of uh, biologists and uh, physicists in the Plon community. Uh, that's people I met. Um, there's also definitely people who have uh, computer science degrees, but I'm, I'm always happy when I find someone who has a, a background in humanities or social sciences. That's still close to my heart. So did you actually finish your thesis, your PhD? No, no, and I get berated for that uh, quite uh, regularly by a couple of people who had interests in that. Uh, but um, so on the upside now, uh, I love doing history, but I hated writing history. Like I had to, hated writing papers and articles and all that stuff. A lot of, I, I liked giving talks actually, even though it was really uh, stressful uh, before that. Um, but, and also I realized there were so many uh, people who were much more intelligent than me and much more, uh, put in much more work than me. But that's true for computer science as well. So nothing changed there, um, but, the job I do now is I love it and it's the same as my hobby. So mm. um, I think it was a very good decision. I would have hated uh, doing history all the time and having to write all the time. So I didn't finish it and I'm not unhappy about that. Any chance you're going to just spend a couple more months and get it done? No, I'd rather uh, use my, uh, my, my topic uh, as dinner conversation over beers. Uh, I was writing about the re-education of German prisoners of war in Britain after the Second World War. Wow. Uh, yeah, the title of the book would have been a bit shorter, I guess, but that's the topic. And it's uh, still, still exciting. Wow. How did you end up learning to speak English so well. This is, this um, is standard education for Germans, right? I don't, it's just practice. Well, the Plum community is the main language is English. So that's one thing. I know, Definitely but... not at school. So I, I remember when I finished school, uh, my English was bad. I went to China for a couple of months traveling with a friend and we all only had to speak uh, English there, sometimes French actually. A couple of uh, Chinese uh, spoke fluent French and my French was much better than my English, but still we had to speak English. So I practiced, it, practiced English for about half a year and Oh, and also uh, I spent a year in Edinburgh at the university studying there. So that might, may have helped. Uh, my, uh, my proudest moment actually in academia was uh, in the library when I uh, got some books in, in Edinburgh at the library. And I, I, don't, I don't know, said something, whatever. And she said, uh, the woman at the counter, she said, Oh, love, you must be Irish. And I was, God. 
That was good. The German with the with a terrible German accent being uh, being uh, misidentified as an Irishman. That that was glorious. I hang I have hung out is probably the right. I hung out with a lot of Irish at that time. That's fantastic. Wow. So all right, so let's 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 go back to our our infamous tour in Sorrento. So I'll just say for for anyone who's listening, that uh, when I arrived in Sorrento for the first time, where we have the uh, open gardens almost every year now for thirteen or fourteen years, uh, the one particular hotel that we've had the open gardens in the same hotel for all that time. Uh, has a basement that we usually would book for the entire period. The, I guess it would be four or five days of the open garden. And then we'd have the use of the garden and the, the poolside restaurant. And then, I guess, the lobby. Although if there's, I guess, a little bit more to say about the lobby. <laughs> but I first went downstairs after checking into my room, throwing my bags in my room. I went downstairs to find other people who were already there. And Philip saw me and said... Kim, you have to come see this. You have to come see this. And I go, what, what? I just, I just got here. And so you pulled me into some hallway. And then at the back of the hallway was this elevator. And I go, I just came from the elevator upstairs. What is this one? This was a different one. And so we went into this elevator. It closed the doors. And Philip was just kind of, he was, he was holding it in. He was trying to get me interested. He was trying to not tell me what this was. And so he pressed the button and there was only one other button and so it went the elevator closed the, the doors closed the elevator started going down and down and down and remember we were already in the basement of the hotel and so my ears started to pop and at the bottom finally after a long time the doors opened and we we're at the base of this cliff that the hotel sits on and the doors open and we had to walk out through a, a stone hallway essentially and it finally opened up in a restaurant when you could see the sunlight streaming in because the restaurant was at the base of the cliff overlooking the ocean and that was the most amazing elevator ride i'd ever been in <laughs> thanks to you for showing me this thing the first thing i saw of the hotel <laughs> it is i i uh, i just went into that elevator without knowing where where it goes and I ended up in this dark, uh, it's, it's, it's a tunnel. It's lo it looks like, a, I don't know, nuclear missile silo or a machine, Lean Maginot uh, mm -hmm. thing. Uh, and maybe a door to the right or left leads to Atlantis or something. But uh, if you follow that, um, that, that hallway, uh, you finally see the sunlight again and you get out to come out to the beach. It's really interesting. And it saves you, uh, it saves you actually the nicest walk because if you go out and down the, uh, uh, at the coast, that's a beautiful walk. And a couple of people at, uh, who've been to Sorrento have never been down there, which is weird. Yeah, we should make sure that everybody has a chance to see that because yeah, it's true that that walk down the, uh, it's, it's sort of winding path carved on the inside face of the, of the cliff and exactly. with occasional holes cut out so you could see outside and, and let light in. But it is the most amazing setting for, for this hotel. Um, it, is, it is beautiful. It's a, it's a pity that sometimes people go there without taking a day off and seeing uh, seeing nice things M myself included i've spent at least two uh plone open gardens without leaving my laptop basically for a minute uh hacking away at mostly i don't know plone app content types uh, migration stuff but uh one uh plone open garden i didn't code anything i didn't do nothing i was only uh sightseeing with the kids and my wife that was good that's right that is one of the big differences between the plone open garden and a lot of the other events which is it's intended to be family friendly and it's intended to be a half at least half relaxing i broke the record there i i came with uh my wife my two daughters uh my mother-in-law and my niece, so 
at the same time. And the year after, I came with my sister, my brother-in-law, and uh, their two kids as well. So I just pack up the whole family. It's a beautiful setting. Have you been eight times? I, I've stopped counting. Mm. Plenty of times. But I'll, I'll definitely come back next year when it, if it happens. I sincerely hope so. I'm still looking for an excuse to go back. I've only been twice. Twice is not even enough time to see all the sights there. Yeah, it does seem like there's there's always something interesting to, to it's catch. This beautiful Museum of Archaeology in Naples uh, with the um, mosaic of uh, the battle of uh, Alexander against Darius. That is mind-blowing. I haven't seen the museums in Naples yet. Just saw um, the dig at, uh, not Ercolano. Darn it. I was kind of like, I'm my, my brain. Pompeii, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's, that's humbling also. That's great. So let's see. What is it that, now you mentioned mosaic, which is an, <laughs> always an interesting way of pronouncing it. So now we've got, We've got, okay, so uh, hopefully everybody listening to this knows that Mosaic is the tile-based editor for Plone content types in Classic Plone, I guess we'll call it, Classic Plone. And now with Volto coming out, we're not using Mosaic, but we're using, and we're not using tiles because they've decided to use the term blocks. So now you've been rewriting the Mastering Plone training class to use Volto. How's that going? Oh, um, I, I was actually planning to do three pull requests yesterday. Yesterday was uh, October 31st, and the last day to put in, pull in three pull requests to get a, a Hacktoberfest shirt. Uh, but I was, um, I, we had friends over, and uh, what started out as a planned two hour, light two hours, ended up in an empty bottle of whiskey and a half empty cask of IPA. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a bit still suffering and also my, my wardrobe is suffering because I'm not getting a t-shirt this year. I couldn't put in my three pull requests in time. Um, so, Who's but still, still it's it? going good. So I did two pull requests yesterday, but not the third oh. uh, for, for the Mastering Clone training. Um, I think since the conference is uh, only uh, online, we only have two days with four hours each for the training. So this is all covered and going well, uh, but the plan is to have the entire training uh, expanded and uh, all everything not moved to Volto, but there's also always a chapter for Volto. Uh, and that's like the default path. And on the side, there is a link to say, if you want to do the same task, not, not exactly the same because it's a different technology, but the same task, for example, showing dates for news items uh, because you want to know when it's published. Um, you can do that in uh, server-side render templates in this chapter. Um, so, but this plan is going uh, pretty well. We're almost done. And we added a couple of new chapters. Uh, that's, um, it's, been, it's been exciting and it still is. I'm, I'm not the React developer uh, guy generally. It's, it's not my area of exper expertise, but I've learned a lot from writing it and I hope people will learn a lot from reading it as well. I think uh, it, has all the things that you need for a, for a website, basically, for a project that you want to do. And you can do that now in Volto or in Classic Plone. This still amazes me that you've done all of this, I mean, really out of the goodness of your heart, your own personal interest. I mean, you, you, are, you are getting better at using Volto, which is gonna help you with your client projects, but- Definitely. I, I think hopefully people who who are listening know that this is something that you are not paid to do, and yet it's it's a monumental amount of work. I mean, when you put together the original mastering plone training class, 
I was astounded at how much content is in there and how well written it is, how well thought through it is. Uh, I, you know, I, I feel bad about this. I just realized this. I mean, I personally ought to pay you and, and the companies I've worked for ought to pay you every time we use your Mastering Plone class to teach our clients how to do something or we'll provide training to our clients and we'll say, yes, sure, we'll we'll give you Plone development training. And essentially what we do is we run through your Mastering Plone class and we get paid to do it and you don't get paid. I feel That's terrible. No, that you, you shouldn't feel bad. I, it's it is also really good marketing. I'm pretty well known, and I get uh, contracts all over the world from uh, people who know that I did that or learn that I did that. So it, it uh, from a business perspective, it definitely pays off, even though it's a uh, it's the long game. So the first instance of the mastering clone training was given at the Arnhem conference, uh, and it was inspired because people. Uh, in San Francisco, uh, attended uh, Martin Espelli's training, and they came out and said they're now more confused than ever. <laughs> because he's, well, you know, Martin, he's speaking so fast and he's thinking so fast. Uh, it's really hard to keep up with him. And uh, I, I think if, that's a bit of an unfair statement not yours but other people who were in that class because i was in that class and i brought with me a colleague a, a junior colleague who's brand new to plone development and he was able to follow what martin was saying i don't i mean maybe it's you know the harry potter the harry potter persona in martin that kind of you know magically conveyed the knowledge but i thought it was a very good class Okay. Um, I'm good, good that you didn't tell me because if you would have told me, I wouldn't have started writing the mastering plum training. Probably. So that's where it started. That's amazing. Okay. Yeah, a couple of people said it's uh, it was confusing and they they want uh, something. It would be nice to have a, a I don't know a training that has a different pace. Maybe I don't know. Uh, so. Patrick and me, my former colleague, uh, we started to, to write the Mastering Clone training for Arnhem. And actually, we were paid for giving the training there. So it's... Oh. But uh, ever since then, uh, the trainers didn't get paid anymore because I, uh, I don't know, I convinced the training or the Clone Foundation to not pay trainers um, according to the many the people who attend uh so if you have five people you get paid by five people if you have 20 you get paid by 20 people uh but uh, just give them some uh, reimbursement uh, in uh, for example uh, the hotel or the conference attendance or both depending on how, how much money there is uh, for the, for the conference that year. And, and the, f the first year that that happened, that the trainers were paid for, paid uh, by being given a housing stipend. Was that in Bucharest 2015? No, that was Barcelona. And uh, no, not Barcelona. When I'm talking Brazil. 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 Oh, that yes. started there. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And uh, yeah, but the, the best, the best house we had was in Boston. That was, that was good. I don't think I saw that place that you stayed in in Boston. Where, we had, where was it? We had, we had an uh, excellent party and a, a glorious uh, game of, how is it called? Uh, Cards Against Humanity. Uh, there was an epic game there. Good party. I remember, I remember we talked about which houses were going to get rented for the trainers. And it had to be really quite large. There were two houses, I think. Yeah, and they they on paper both looked about the same size. So I, we I split uh, the trainers uh, in half, and it turned out one was basically a small apartment, and the other was a huge house with two fla uh, with two uh, floors. Uh, floors. And uh, so, but we so uh, on the second or third day, we moved a couple of people from the smaller one to the bigger one. Mm. Still Sorry, I didn't play. get to see that house. Hmm. It was great. It was really expensive. Boston is terrible. It was. Um, so when I was working, uh, at, well, at the time I was working for Wildcard, and we paid probably six hundred dollars a night for a condo, but we we packed a lot of people 
<laughs> so right, so I slept next to uh, to Armin. That's right, and oh, everybody snores like hell. I shared a room That's... with Armin in Sorrento. I regret it to the day. So uh, I would say that he, yes, he snores loudly, but it wasn't terrible. <laughs> My ears are still ringing. <laughs> yeah, and then we had another fellow from Wildcard who was sleeping on the floor. Yeah, that was that was that was very interesting. Um, but okay, now I'm remembering back to that training with uh, that Martin gave in 2011, and I remember uh, that's where I met Nate's for the first time, oh. and um, and then I think part way through the class, maybe maybe was it the first day, uh, this very disheveled guy bursts into the classroom and looks around. And he says, oh, "I think this is the class I'm I'm supposed to be in." And we realized it was Franco Pellerini, who'd flown oh. in from Argentina. Yes. And this is the guy who, uh, I mean, he was this unknown person in the Plone community. And a few months before, he'd kind of made a big entrance by announcing he'd come up with a built-in Plone IDE running inside Plone to edit Plone. And that was yes. like mind-blowing. And everybody put together, I guess it was a crowdfunding thing, and it sold yeah. out. It got him from Argentina to San Francisco. And I remember that was the first time I met him and he was complaining that it took him 33 hours to get from uh, wherever the, I can't remember the name of the town in the middle of Argentina all the way to San Francisco. But every other year that I've seen him at a Plone event, he's always complained that it's also taken him 33 hours <laughs> to get there. So it's like, wherever it is, it's always 33 hours from where he lives. Oh, I hope it wasn't wasn't the case in, in, uh, in Brazil. I don't know. It might have been. We should find out. Maybe he lives in a, just, I don't know, in the middle of nowhere and has to take a two-day donkey ride to the next airport. You know, he's, I think he got his pilot's license. Excellent. You know he, so next time he can take a direct flight. That's probably why. It's probably yeah. just he hates, you know, the 33 hours it's going to take, so he might as well fly himself. But that's why he, when he came to Oshkosh for the Plone Symposium here, 2013, I think. Yeah, he he said, oh, you got to hold it right next to the Oshkosh EAA, the uh, the fly-in, the Experimental Aircraft Association fly-in, which is known around the world. And so I think maybe 100,000 people fly in with their planes and friends and family and maybe two or 300,000 more come and visit. And so he kept saying, well, we got to do this because he wanted to see the, the air show and because he's a pilot or he's a fan of, of airplanes. <laughs> That's funny. You need a plone so, plane. What's that? A plone plane? Yeah, we have a plone pilot now. Uh, we need a plone plane. We we had a plone bus too, I think, right? Oh, we actually had a plone. I, I was planning. Uh, I was uh, when in 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 Brazil we had the conference, and right after the conference there was the sprint in João Pessoa. And I thought we're organizing like all the developers go on the same plane. And uh, we had uh, terrible jokes about that being really risky for the plone community because if that plane goes down, it yep. goes half our developer power. That's, That's right. Bad. So I was in a plane with only three other plonistas. So we took the safe way and only allowed maximum number of three plonistas on a plane. Seriously, you organize that? We should make that? that a rule for the next couple of years. Yeah, we should. That's that's astounding. That's great that you did that. I remember uh, that was that was a year that I didn't make it to the conference, unfortunately, because was, I just uh, organized oh the God, one in Oshkosh. So you know what we did? We had uh, the sprint was in that hotel, and the the top floor was like open, and you could see the ocean, and the wind was coming in, so it wasn't too hot. It was uh, that was great, and there was a pool. And we had the stand-ups in the pool with fresh coconuts, uh, half filled with the cachaça. It was then uh, Swen called that coco loco, I think. Yes, I still regret to this day not having gone to that conference. I still regret every plum conference I haven't been to before I went to my first one in, uh, in Washington. I wasn't in Naples, Vienna, and Seattle. Uh, yeah, so for me, 20, 2008 was the first 
in Washington, D.C. And then the next one was San Francisco 2011 because the university, I, I just didn't feel like it was right to ask to travel internationally. And so uh, 2012, I missed Arnhem. Uh, 2013, I organized the Plum Symposium Midwest in Oshkosh in May and June. And that's why I didn't feel it would be right to ask to go, <laughs> even though I really wanted to, to go to Brazil, I couldn't ask. So, but what kind of logic is that? You organize something for open uh, source and open source event. And because you put in the work to organize something, you're not asking to go to another event. That's like you got it backwards, man. You should, you should have talked to me then because my, I guess my reasoning was that I'd already put so much work and got so many people's time to organize, to, to run the, conference, the event here. I didn't feel like it was justifiable to, to say to the university. And on top of that, you need to pay two, three thousand dollars to get me to go to another Plone event. Um, but I haven't missed one since 2014 in Bristol. So that's been good. That's good. Yeah, they were all epic. I love that the Plum Conference organizers are tweeting photos from the uh, previous locations and people are sharing their stories. I'm, um, I wasn't much involved in sharing, but I'm, my memory always goes when I hear these things and see the pictures. I think just the other day there was a photo that came out that was, you were in it, we were in Tokyo after the dinner uh, this at this place. amazingly f interesting restaurant that was, uh, uh, it had, okay, so we had asked the Tokyo organizers if they could recommend a restaurant for us, and they did, so then we showed up, and I remember thinking, there isn't a, p uh, there isn't a word of English on signage, menu, anything, and that was the most amazing eye-opening session where we all had to use various translation tools on our phones, fortunately, <laughs> to try to make sense of the menu, even though it was and electronic. Alex called his wife to try to translate some, even though he said he understands enough Japanese, which uh, obviously didn't, didn't help at that point. That's right. So we ultimately had to fall back on a human. Yeah. I was, I, I'm, I'm such a pity I'm not seeing uh, my plant family this year. It's, uh, I'm, that's, I miss, I'll, I'm going to miss that a lot. But I, I was super lucky. So in, uh, in early, uh, late February, like just before everything shut down in Germany, before schools were closed, there was the uh, plant um, tagung in Dresden at the University of Dresden. And they had the, marvelous organization, excellent organizers, really nice people and lots of people uh, coming there and there was a great Plown event and on the plane back uh, everybody started wearing masks and uh, nothing ever happened after that. And it was actually the, play, the, the train ride back was the last time I went to the city center of Munich where I live uh, for a couple of months uh, into the pandemic. I just stayed here and worked from home. All my clients, uh, I'm doing remote work uh, mostly anyway. So, mm -hmm. yeah, same for us. So I, ha I had my share of clone uh, people in uh, people this year already a little. Yeah, I feel like I feel I feel a loss. Um, it is definitely weird not to be able to be in the same place. I remember thinking about all the fun that we had last year in Ferrara and uh, just in addition to the talks and the keynotes and the, the lightning talks, there's all this other stuff that goes on that's just running into somebody and then having a conversation and missing the first part of the next talk because heck, you're having a hell of a time just catching up or the bar right outside the cinema where the conference was held and just going in there and seeing it get packed with people just sitting around talking sharing stories or late nights wandering around the streets of Ferrara trying to find a restaurant or the the official restaurant <laughs> one, one that still accepts people because they were all pretty packed yeah yeah the the social aspect of the plow conference is uh, the most important one I, I love the talks and I love the videos of the talks I also love giving talks but the uh, the whole way track, as you say, uh, that's always 
I don't know, the best, after, at least after the first day when you like got your first uh, fill of uh, new information, then it's uh, a lot of that ends up being uh, just social. So this new, okay, I guess this is definitely not some sort of weird ad placement thing, but uh, <laughs> you know, the loud swarm platform that we, we made at Six Feet Up for online events, this is one of the things that we were trying to recapture, which is that social element, that, that hallway track, and the ability to try to connect with other people who are attendees. Because if you just watch some, I mean, well, a few of us have been, I'm sure you have too, you've watched other online events since the start of the pandemic. And yeah, you get the talks, and sometimes you have breakout rooms where you could talk to the, the presenter and ask questions. But then the rest of the attendees, you never really talk to. You have no opportunity to, to meet and catch up with um, or even get to know in the first place. And so I, this is something that, that we're still working on. We're trying, trying to figure out what other ways we can allow for there to be more social mixing. And just the, the, the chance encounters with somebody who says, Psst, have you seen this elevator? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how, yeah. could, how could we recreate that? With an online event platform, I don't know. Maybe we can. That's a very good question. I um, I'm really frustrated with uh, online events. I gave a, a workshop on Python debugging on Wednesday for a conference. Uh, it was called Python Summit. Even um, it's probably just a marketing title. Um, it was a good event. Uh, we had, I had a couple of people in a Zoom conference, uh, but the interaction with the audience uh, that you have in the training is much different than looking at, I don't know, 20 uh, muted uh, and uh, video switched off uh, streams. Some of them were switched on, but that was definitely um, weird. And it, it will definitely be weird to teach the mastering clone training uh, via Zoom. Uh, that's going to be a challenge to uh, it's it's good to have two teachers uh, to to trainers uh, for breakout sessions so that you can assist individual people but the um, there's just I don't know as a as someone who gives give who, who teaches who loves that and who loves to react to the audience uh, them nodding off or being being excited uh, or being being I don't know uh, you don't even know if your jokes are funny because you don't see anyone laughing. So you have to assume they're not. So please don't just. I see. On the other hand, what I do is I imagine they're loving my jokes. <laughs> it yeah. works. It works. But you know, you remember Annette Lewis? Yes, sure. Annette Lewis, my colleague. Okay. Yeah. So Annette and Annette and I started giving your mastering clone class to uh, a client that we have. I guess I can't say too much. It's it's a university um, in the in the southern United States, and they they needed uh, Plone development training to catch up on Plone development since like Plone three, which is what they've been using. And so we we said, sure, we'll give you the mastering Plone class by Philip Bauer. Um, and so Annette and I traded off. We did. Um, actually, she did most of the she did the training for this one because uh, there have been other clients where. Uh, we we gave training together, but this one she led, and the first day I sat in, uh, it was a four hour, four hour session really, and I sat in. So whenever there was an issue, we could split off so that I could help the person who was having a problem, and we'd do a breakout room or a separate Zoom. I'd work work through their problem with them and then bring them back into the main Zoom. So I think it can work um, if you've got multiple instructors or assistants. Who can help that way? But you're right. The the not having the camera on is makes it really hard to gauge. First of all, if they're paying attention, are they even there? And do they do they look like they've got that they, that they understood the problem or the the information you're giving, or are they puzzled by something? Um, do you think it's do you think it would be accept, acceptable to um, make it required that people turn on their camera? No, no, definitely not. I don't know. I wouldn't uh, try to enforce that. It would be just, you can ask them to do that. That would be nice. 
but um, um, what you said, uh, it, uh, the mustering plum tree, I put in a lot of work in that, that is true, but it's definitely not by me only. There's a lot of people who have been working on this training. Uh, you, uh, you did some, some changes, but uh, all, all the people who ever gave a mastering clone training have been doing, reworking and rewriting chapters and doing stuff. Uh, Thomas Shaw did a lot in the last couple of years. Uh, Patrick, uh, who, who co-wrote it with me uh, initially, uh, wrote large parts of it. And so I'm, I'm not the only one to uh, blame or uh, praise here. We have a lot of uh, really excite, uh, good uh, and uh, excellent teachers and uh, trainers in, in the Plum community who love training every year. That reminds me. So you, you do a really good job of deflecting credit. Um, uh, last year, actually probably starting in Tokyo, uh, everyone was looking to you as the leader for migrating Plone to Python 3. And I remember that you, you once again did the same thing you've, you've done just now, which is you made sure that other people got credit for the work that, that you were helping with or you were helping to organize. I think that's something that's, um, it's, 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 it's a very it's impressive ego, thing. Because I want to be mentioned by other people when I help with something. That's why I do it. I try to be nice so people can be nice to me. It works. It works. Yeah, but but since, uh, sincerely, Python 3 migration, that was a huge group effort. And I know I led that and I did a lot of work and I was enthusiastic about some of that, even though in hindsight, I have a hard time understanding what's, what's exciting about doing that hard work. But um, like the baby steps that you get and uh, only, only 500 tests are failing now, much better. Uh, that is, um, it, was, it was exciting, but a lot of people helped and it couldn't have been done uh, without, I don't know, so many people, Jens, uh, David, whoever. I'm reminded now of uh, a rather inflammatory post I put in the forum maybe oh a month and a half ago. I still hate you for that. <laughs> that was, I mean, that was a it, post. It was so about let me, migration. Let me, let me introduce, let me introduce you know, how inflammatory it was. Okay, yeah, so it was inflammatory. Uh, no. What I started off doing was uh, I'd been very frustrated because uh, it wasn't just me personally, but uh, at, at our company at Six Feet Up, we'd been doing plone migration work and working pretty hard on it. And it was, and, and thanks, and with your help too, because we hired you to come back in and give us some, some specialized training for our developers to do the Python, Python 3 migration. But I myself had been trying to migrate my wife's site. And so I'll get this. So my wife's site is the imsss.net, which is the International Medieval Sermon Studies Society website which we've been running for about 12 years now um, using Plone, of course. And so it's been running Plone for something and I've been trying to migrate it to Python, uh, to, to Python 3 on Plone 5.2 and I had all this frustration. And in the end, I just posted in the forum in a fit of frustration, like, I think it's time that we end this concept that Plone can be upgraded in place and we should come up with a new story. And I remember you were very kind and laying out all the reasons why I was wrong, <laughs> but you very calmly did so. You totally destroyed my argument. That was great. No, it it has validity. Uh, the, so I have a secret uh, secret business plan here. So I'm trying to make migrations as hard as possible, so I can make money out of that. Um, now that's not true, actually. I put in a lot of time to allow people to migrate. I wrote the migration from archetypes to dexterity and I argued for that to be built in. I wrote the, uh, the custom content type migration uh, where you can pick the content type that you want to migrate from to the one that you want to migrate to and map the fields to each other and all that nonsense and documented and gave talks about all of this. Um, and though, so is it because I put in so much time, I was frustrated that you were frustrated, but I totally understood the frustration. There's a couple of things that are really hard on customized sites uh, to 
say, here's a recipe for uh, migration, even though we have no idea what you did to your site, you have to follow this story. That is really, uh, that would be a magic bullet. Um, so it's, there's a good, it's, it's a good thing that we have an alternative strategy to export content uh, and re-import it via the Plone REST API or uh, JSONifier. There's a couple of approaches there that we sincerely need to put in more work to document them. Um, but I still, I'm, a, I'm still a huge fan of uh, migrating sites in place if th that um, working on that, I'm, I'm a huge fan of making that possible because uh, there's a lot of information uh, still that you will lose with every other way that you migrate. There are just things that you you uh, that are really hard to migrate. Uh, custom settings. Uh, I don't know. I'm pretty sure there is no JSON migration for uh, the portlets that are assigned to a group, for example, or to a content type. Maybe there is, but there, there's, it's just one example. There are so many things. Uh, content rules, uh, manually com, um, uh, 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 configured content rules uh, that would be just lost. And I'm, I'm always happy when I get uh, from a client, uh, I, I ask, can we lose this and that? Can we please drop all of the history, for example, all the file history, uh, all the versioning? Can we drop uh, all the users? Can we just move them to LDAP? Can we drop, I don't know, every, all, the, uh, all the configuration on all the custom workflow configuration that they probably did through in the browser without ever documenting anything? Uh, and it's a nightmare. Uh, because they switched off inheriting, inheriting uh, permissions from the parent, and then you log in and you don't see anything. That's just, uh, it's good to get rid of all this stuff uh, during a migration. But I, I, I see the point that it, this is, it is still hard. You know, on the, on the workflow thing, isn't that something that you can export? Like, yeah, you, you, you can export... Uh, yeah, you can, but you can export a lot. It's like it's like everything. All the all the ZDXP uh, stuff. Yeah, I mean that's still that's still import. Well, sort of. Well, well especially for portal workflows. Excellent uh, generic setup, export handlers and import handlers. So there's not not a lot to complain in Plone about that. It's just when you do it in place, especially if you have I don't know. I wrote this. I'm gonna give a talk at the conference about. Uh, the, the, the Python 3, not the Python 3 migration, but what happens in your database if you're referencing non-existing code and how to deal with that. I wrote a um, pretty long piece of that. I'm going to try to turn that into a concise talk. Uh, so that's one talk idea. Do you have another talk that you submitted? Uh, I submitted a couple of lightning talks, but uh, no, no other talk that I can think of. Um, I hope I'm, it's it's not that exciting. What, what, I love the the projects that I'm doing at the moment. So and there, but a lot of them involve migration stuff or updating stuff or rewriting things with the new approaches. Actually, I wrote my own uh, mosaic. By the way, you mentioned mosaic and Volto, and not my own mosaic, but it's. It's like uh, it's content in a folder, uh, and you rearrange that. Uh, it's way simpler because the, uh, but it has a very specific use case, and it needs to be content. The, the tile need to be content. Uh, but you mentioned Volto and Mosaic, and um, there's I'm really excited. There's going to be a training on Volto add-ons because there is so much work going on there. There is actually a, a Volto Mosaic. Ah, yeah. I did not know uh, this. It's experimental. I'm not sure if you can actually use that, uh, but there are a lot of add-ons that are being developed and a lot of companies are putting time into that and uh, just solving their use cases, uh, not only for their clients, but turning them into add-ons. Like that's the best thing that the Plone community has to offer, offer is when you have a problem 
and you solve that for a client and uh, you not only get paid, but you uh, also take that solution, uh, turn it into something you reusable by other people. So right. everyone benefits. So that's, that's exactly something that uh, at Six Feet Up, we just discussed with uh, a client of ours, which is a, a big institution that uses Plone. And uh, especially over the last year and a half, we've really we've been able to expand uh, the number of users inside this big organization. And the code that we built, because it was based on the original uh, Plone Conference code from 2016, uh, we're able to enhance that and, and basically give it back to others who can use it too. So that's, that's a great aspect of Plone development that people don't think about when um, they're using a proprietary system. But it's, it's great to be able to contribute that back um, yeah. So I, I'm, I was going to ask you, uh, on the topic of Volto, um, how, how do you feel the Plone community at large is taking the idea that the default front end for Plone 6 is going to be Volto? Do you think there's still acceptance in that? Is the, the roadmap that we came up with, I think it was probably almost two years ago, that that is still something that people are on board with? That's a very good question. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I think it's the, uh, it's, it's as true to, it's very true to the uh, heart of the Plone community that there is uh, as much enthusiasm as there is skepticism and outright total denial. Uh, so we are, we've always been, uh, not not everyone was on the same page uh, regarding that. A lot of people hate React, for example. Even people who do, do a lot of JavaScript development think that React is just a poorly designed, uh, over-engineered, I don't know, whatever system. Hmm. Uh, poorly and designed and over-engineered. To do exactly the same, but just with a different, uh, with Vue.js, for example, or something else. I'm, uh, I'm agnostic, uh, so I, I don't care, uh, basically. I, th I love it and I think people are on board with it because they see that it's working and that it's uh, usable. Um, the uh, f fear uh, was uh, real and uh, well, uh, and, uh, not baseless um, that the uh, the classic backend, uh, the classic front end, like uh, server side render templates, is not getting enough love. And uh, there's a part of the Plone community always been and always will be that is complaining uh, about uh, other people not doing enough work, even though they're not doing any. And some of them are stepping up. Uh, and doing work, and it's, it's like historically been always uh, the same. Me, I started doing Plone development because I was, was annoyed with a feature in Plone that I didn't like. So I wrote a package that undid that feature, basically. What was that feature? Can't remember, but uh, I know Stefan wanted to call that uh, delimification because that ah. was a feature that Limi liked and he, he didn't like it. So, and I wrote that and he said, we didn't use that name because that was just a stupid pun. Um, so I was uh, saying there, there was real fear that the, um, there was no progress made on the uh, classic stack and uh, with the uh, project of reviving and rewriting the, uh, the classic theme uh, based on Bootstrap 4 or even 5, if 5 is gonna be released soon enough, um, there has been a lot of uh, progress and that is, that's a good thing. And uh, all the JavaScript is being modernized or uh, not the, um, the mock-up uh, and uh, pattern slip. And uh, Hannes put in a lot of work there and will hopefully finish that uh, updating jQuery and stuff like that. Um, so that is good because now both user interfaces are being one is completely new and is exciting and for new projects i would certainly uh prefer to use volto 
but there are still some projects where this is uh, a no-go because of requirements or because it's an existing project already. You can't just move an existing site to Volto. That doesn't, uh, unless it's just a site. But if it's a project where you have a lot of custom development uh, already in there, that's, that's just not a feasible option unless uh, the client has a lot of money. Um, yeah. So I'm, 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 I'm excited about both things. And I think the community can be happy that both, uh, both front ends are going to be in a great state when Plone 6 uh, comes around. My take on Plone 6 is that usually for any major version increase, we have to provide some significant change in backend functionality and some significant change in front end, front user facing, uh, like UI change. And so Volto definitely addresses the user-facing part of that. Do we have any back-end functionality that's significantly different going into Plone 6? Um, well, we had two major clips, but uh, both are not uh, production-ready. One is uh, using uh, Dexterity for the uh, site route, which will maybe will make it into the release. Uh, but there are still issues with that. Uh, and the other is um, instance behaviors, which didn't take off so far, as far as I know. And I think, um, why would we need changes in the backend? So we're dropping a Python version, but there's no backend features that we need that we don't have, so that we need to change something. There is instance behaviors. There is a package that provides that. You can use that. But uh, putting that in into the core uh, will be harder. Uh, and the changes that come with Volto or moving a site to Volto uh, also on the backend are uh, immense. If you use the uh, Pastanaga editor, you get a uh, a JSON schema from the blocks and not a dexterity schema. That's uh, and there is no one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, mapping for these two at the moment. Uh, so there, for uh, from from a developer uh, perspective, there is still uh, enough change to be challenged by. Uh, I'd say, um, and it's it's for me, it's just great to drop Python two support. That's. Mm -hmm exciting. I realized that one bad thing about that is we're going to drop the migration code. We're not, no longer supporting the migration code in Plone app content types. So you have to migrate to Dexterity in Plone 5.2, which totally makes sense because it doesn't run in Python 3. Uh, but the code there is uh, close to my heart. I spent a lot of time on, on that. And seeing it go away is like, it was a good friend. Help well, with a lot of projects. It will it'll, still, it still, it'll will. still be there, and it'll still be buried under the ice in Norway. <laughs> That's true. I'm did you get that? You, you, I mean, I'm sure you did because I, I think I'm, I'm one of the developers who got that little badge. Yeah, I definitely am an Arctic uh, developer. I'm not sure how that's called. What do you think is in the crystal ball for the date for Plone Six release? Oh my God. I so the Barcelona, the new one, uh, is not merged yet. Um, Volto, I think, is production ready, even though the the deployment and shipping story in the uh, in, in, in the in the unified installer is probably not a hundred percent solved because they're focusing on other things and nobody's. Looking at that, because if you do a project, you don't care, because if you do a project, you don't care about the default installation story. Um, I'd say, I hope early next year, and I really want to see uh, alpha, but it doesn't make sense to have an alpha before we merge the Barceloneta changes. It makes, it's okay to have uh, um, alpha without a, uh, a unified installer story for Volto, uh, but um, the Bassinetta uh, changes need to be merged before that. And they, I know they're working on that a lot. Every, there's a call every week, and uh, a colleague of mine, Steffen, he's uh, also participating in that, and I'm trying to, uh, 
I don't know, um, keep 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 tabs on that, find out what's what's happening. But there is still some work to be done. So that's I think that's currently the blocker. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but that's the, once the that is there and merged, then we can have an alpha and okay, then things get serious and we can have I wanted to have a beta or a release candidate for the conference, but that's obviously not gonna happen and it's Things are done when they're done. It's, uh, it's always yeah. been the case, and now we have an excellent excuse with the pandemic. <laughs> but we also have the other the excuse going the other way. We delayed the conference by almost a month. So you'd think that really, come on, you got an extra month. Yeah, I'm I'm not taking any of the blame because I'm not working on uh, on any of these two. I'm trying to get the mastering clone training ready for clone six. And I'm kind of happy that's a bit delayed because otherwise I would have had to put in more time. But uh, it will be. Uh, I'm, I'm going to hold up uh, my ends definitely, and uh, we'll discuss uh, everything else that still needs to be done. There's going to be this. Uh, we have we now have this new um, steering circle uh, meeting. Uh, I think every month or every two months. Or it's every two months, unless I I was disinvited to the second one. I haven't. Oh, what did you do? What the... did you do? <laughs> did you do something wrong? Probably. Um, yeah, but that's the problem when there is no sprints in place in person, where you get the right people together, and uh, because there are online sprints and they're nice, but if you sit together uh, in the evening. You talk about everything, but at some point you also talk about clone and you talk about releasing and about uh, roadmaps and about features and about documentation and how to, what to put on the front page when you go to port 8080 and your clone instance is running, but it's clone six and Volto is actually on a different port. Are you going to, uh, what, what are you going to do then? So uh, all these uh, things are easier discussed in person. It's also mm -hmm. way more fun. It is. I'm a little worried about the unified installer because that, that has been problematic the last two, three months, just getting new releases of Plone working on that thing. And I can see how more complicated it's going to be to have Volto in there. Well, I'm maintaining our build outs. So I'm not using the unified installer, but it is definitely a uh, entry point into Plone and it needs to be, uh, well done. So if you go and install Plone, that's mm -hmm. it needs to be there, and the story for Volto needs to be thought through. But it's thought through, and we wrote some of that down already. But um, still, there's uh, writing something share down and talking me. about that is not the same as actually doing it and documenting mm -hmm. it and creating mockups and screenshots and whatnot. All right. Well. I think, I think we should probably stop this uh, the the interview, this extended interview. That's been a lot of fun. It's been very enlightening for me. Um, I've gotten a better idea of what's going on with Volto and current development, and so thank you, Philip. You're welcome. You should talk to the Volto early adopters meeting. I'm not part of that. I'm just I'm sitting on the sidelines and peeking in and various groups and what they're doing, having a general interest in getting, getting stuff out of the door. Um, but basically, yeah, it's it got nothing to say. I'm just, uh, I'm awed at, at uh, the work that people are putting in into Volto and also the uh, new Barcelona and everything else that happens in Plone. Well, you're one of those people who's contributed so much and uh, really without you, I don't know where Plone would be. So you're one of those people. So thank you. You'd, you'd probably still use archetypes and you'll love it because there's a couple of features in archetypes that dexterity still doesn't have. I'm not, I'm not going to talk, tell, tell, uh, but I, I, I met them. I had to write a couple of new field types, especially for a project because they, uh, there were a couple features missing. Never mind. It's all good. Everything is, there are no drawings. Uh, these are not the bugs you're looking for. Everything is excellent. All right. 
Thanks, Kim. It was a blast you, uh, talking to you. And um, I'll see I'll have you, you back. on the Star Destroyer hopefully soon. Thank you.